Okay, hello GCSE students. Welcome back to the Science Shack for this next genetics video. This is a really, really good one. Students love this one. Uh, it's really uh, useful for explaining an awful lot of stuff that you will probably know intuitively already. Right? It's a, uh, it's a fantastic sort of explanation of things you've probably heard your entire life. Oh, hasn't he got his dad's nose? Hasn't he got his mum's eyes? And obviously I don't mean that literally. I mean that in terms of a, a family resemblance. So that's where we're going to start. Okay. So this is what we're looking at, really, it's on genetic inheritance. Um, there's an awful lot of words to go through, which we're going to go through what all these words mean. You are expected to know them, and you are expected to use them in the correct context, context at the correct time. You're also expected to, to work out, given information about parents, how you end up with certain offspring, with certain genes, and certain appearances. Okay. So as I say, let's start with family resemblance. Now, I don't know these guys. This is the first picture that comes up that says family resemblance when you google that on google image search so these guys are uh, a family and as you can see they they bear a, a resemblance to each other maybe you bear resemblance to your family there's certainly characteristics that i've got in in, in common with both my mum and my dad and we should know already that that is because of dna it's because of genes that's why it's in this topic but we're going to go into a little bit more about the mechanics and it is literally mechanics clockwork about how um these things pass down the generations. It's a very, very logical, very sort of mathematical topic. Okay, so let's start with this. You have two copies of each gene in every single cell of your body. One is from your mum and one is from your dad. Okay, so chromosomes, they come in pairs. Okay, you get one chromosome from each parent, two copies of each gene, therefore. So the crucial point here, of course, is they are not always the same. Okay. Yes, they will both be the gene for making the same thing, but they won't necessarily do it in the same way. And the classic example that every biology teacher for years and years and years has been using is eye colour. OK, so you've got two genes for eye colour. You've got one from your mum, one from your dad, and they don't necessarily have to be the same. OK, so different versions of genes. OK, we say this is within homologous pairs. Homologous means the same genes, but maybe not the same versions okay so you've got two chromosome ones two chromosome two two chromosome three two chromosome four so on and so forth right that's called a homologous pair okay and chromosomes in a homologous pair contain the same genes code for the same protein same characteristics but they don't necessarily have the same versions of those genes okay so for example using eye color as the example one chromosome may have the instruction for eye colour to make a brown eye and one may have blue okay, or green or whatever it might be. Okay, So here are your two homologous pairs. Now remember that big rant I had in the last video about what is a pair of chromosome and what isn't. Now look, these are not attached in the middle, so therefore these are a pair of chromosomes, one from your mum, one from your dad. So the allele for brown eyes might be there. Okay, So that bit of that gene there is where eye colour lives. Okay, and it's the same on this one. This version of that gene might code for a brown pigment. This version of that gene might code for a blue pigment. Okay, now this is a really important keyword. Each different version of a gene is called an allele. So that is what an allele is. Now, this is a word heavy lesson. So I suggest you make a list of these keywords. Okay, as you get these down. So, allele. Just to reiterate this really important one is a different version of the same gene at the same place on a pair of chromosomes. OK, I used filing cabinets as an analogy in the last video. So imagine you've got two ad almost identical filing cabinets with identical sets of instructions, identical files in them for making identical things. You open two equivalent drawers, you go to the equivalent file, they will both be instructions for making the same thing but they might do it two slightly different ways. So it's the same set of instructions, but two different versions. So making a cake is the classic example. Recipes, making a cake. So you might have two cake recipes, one for chocolate, one for vanilla. Okay, right, so that's very important. You can pause the video and get that down, but we're gonna move straight on. More words, phenotype and genotype. Now these are important words to know because one is what you look like and one is what's actually inside your cells. So your phenotype right, is what the organism actually looks like. Right? It's the result of what the genes actually express. It's the result of the proteins that the genes make. So 
Phenotype for the eye for eyes would be your eyes' actual colour. It would be blue or brown or green or whatever. Okay. The genotype is the actual alleles of the organism has. So what genes you got? Well, I've got two blue, uh, two blue genes, two brown genes, one brown, one blue. That's a genotype. So genotype is the genetics, is the genes inside. Phenotype is what is expressed. Okay. Now the genes are expressed. They're used to make proteins, as we've done in a previous lesson. And the result is the phenotype. Worth getting those two words down. Making sure there's a definition there. Okay. Moving on. More words. Now your those two alleles could be the same, but they could be different. And that's what these two words, homo and heterozygous, means. The prefix homo means same, hetero means different. Okay, so you can get an idea which is which already. So a homozygous set of alleles is one where you've got the same. So if you've got someone with a homozygous set for brown eyes, they've got brown eyes on one gene, uh, brown eyes on one chromosome, brown eyes on the other. So the allele for brown on one and brown on the other. Obviously, they're going to have brown eyes. Same goes for someone with allele for blue eyes on that side, allele for blue eyes on that side. Obviously, they're going to have blue eyes. Okay, that is someone who is homozygous. Okay, the opposite, heterozygous, is one of each. Okay, so what colour do you reckon would be produced by someone who's got an allele for brown eyes and an allele for blue eyes? Well, to get into that one, we have to get two other words: dominant and recessive. So homo and heterozygous, very important. Homo means same alleles, hetero means different alleles. Dominance and recessiveness, right? Dominant is the one that shows up when there's only one copy. For recessive, you need two. Okay, now that might be a little bit unclear, but it should give you an idea of what colour this person's eyes are going to end up being. So let's look at those terms together. Okay, so the allele for blue eyes is recessive to the allele for brown eyes. So individual A here, who's got this, this pair of chromosomes, right, has got a blue gene here and a brown gene here. We say they are heterozygous, okay? This person here with two brown genes, we say they're homozygous. And because brown is dominant, you can actually say this person is homozygous dominant. That is their genotype. Their phenotype is brown eyes, okay? This person over here is homozygous recessive because they've got two blue genes. Okay, so we'd say that their genotype is homozygous recessive, their phenotype blue eyes. Okay, so heterozygous, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive. Okay, homozygous, either recessive or dominant, means two of the same allele of a gene, and heterozygous is two different alleles. Now, if you ask the question, what, how do you define a dominant gene? Well, the easiest way to answer that question is one that shows up in the phenotype when there's only one copy. Recessive right, only shows up in the phenotype when there are two copies. OK, so that's what homozygous heterozygous is. Now, you've got a lot of new language there already. We've got alleles. We've got homozygous we've got heterozygous. We've got dominance. We've got recessiveness. OK, we're not stopping there, though. So let's try and put this together. So our dominant alleles are always expressed in the cell's phenotype. So you only need one copy. Recessive, you need two. So the classic uh, example is eye colours. Big, And uh, what we tend to do is if an allele is dominant, we tend to give it the capital letter. And if it's recessive, we tend to give it the, the lowercase letter. And this is what happens in the exam questions uh, as well. Good tip, don't use a letter that looks the same in its upper and lower case, like C right, or S. That's a pretty bad way to start drawing genetics diagrams out because it can get very confusing. OK, so moving on, let's start using this information to work out some eye colours. So let's go back to our person here, the allele for brown eyes and the allele for blue eyes. Well, hopefully you should have worked out by now because the brown eye allele is dominant. Brown is dominant to blue. That person will have brown eyes. OK, they've got a blue eye gene in their genotype, but their phenotype is brown eyed. OK, so. In terms of dominant genes, right? if you've got two parents, one who's got blue eyes and one who's got brown, each is controlled by a gene, brown genes dominant to blue, one of each gets passed to the child, the child will clearly have brown eyes. And it doesn't matter how many times you do that cross, if the parents' genes are like this, if dad is homozygous dominant and mum is homozygous recessive, 
and this is your first introduction to what's called a Punnett square or a genetic diagram and you can be asked to draw these in uh, a GCSE or an exam okay then the first thing we do is we go well during meiosis where the cells split in half every single sperm that that dad produces is going to get a copy of that dominant allele same with mum and her eggs right every single egg is going to get a copy of that little blue allele so it doesn't matter which sperm meets which egg at all so if this sperm meets this egg here right it's going to be a dominant brown and a recessive blue same for any combination of those so you get a hundred percent brown-eyed uh, brown-eyed offspring from this cross mum's got blue eyes dad's got brown eyes all the children are going to be brown eyed okay i hope that's clear so we're going to do loads more of those diagrams they're called punnett squares or genetic diagrams and i'm going to show you a load more examples in this lesson and next so i'm sure some of you certainly if you were in class in front of me you'd have all had your hands up asking this obvious question straight away if you followed this to this point it comes every year every single question is like how so the obvious question is how can people with brown eyed have blue eyed kids okay or into green there how can they have a blue eyed parent and green eyed kids or you know whatever it might be now obviously we're simplifying here to brown blue right there are lots of different alleles lots of different shades of brown and blue as i'm sure you know but let's keep it simple for now brown and blue right if you are brown eyed you could be like one of the offspring from the last genetic cross you could have a blue eyed recessive gene there and just not know about it it could be hidden away so you won't know about this because it will be recessive it will be being masked in the phenotype by your brown eye gene okay but that doesn't mean you can't pass it on okay so if we did the cross like that so let's say both mum and dad were brown eyed but unbeknownst to them they had a blue eyed recessive gene half of dad's sperm because remember the sperm cells and the egg cells are haploid cells they're half cells right half of them will get the one allele and half of them will get the other okay so half get the brown allele and half get the blue allele depending on which one of his chromosomes ends up in that sperm same with mum half her eggs will be one uh, allele and half her eggs will be the other now we've got actual variety that's going to happen so if by random chance this sperm met this egg it would be big b big b we would call that person homozygous dominant and their phenotype would be brown eyed okay this person here if this egg met with this sperm would be heterozygous and their phenotype would be brown eyed this person here would be the same if this sperm met that egg there okay now the interesting bit and the answer to the question how can brown eyed people have blue eyed children is this person here if both the recessive genes came together because both those um, uh, both those chromosomes came together a blue eyed carrying sperm and a blue eyed carrying egg then you've got someone who is homozygous recessive right homozygous recessive and therefore has blue eyes okay now you could be asked to do that to draw something like that it wouldn't necessarily be eye color it could be anything right and the marks on a gcse paper a level it can be a little bit more demanding but gcse the marks are like this you get a mark for picking out the question what the parental genotypes are and writing those correctly mark for the gametes mark for filling in the table and a mark to answer the question now that's if it's a four mark um question often these are three marks and the mark that's missing then is the gametes so working out the parental gametes filling in the table now i cannot stress this one enough the question might ask you to say how a blue-eyed uh, child comes about and that's what this is so many times i see students filling in the table doing all the hard work and then going done and not actually answering the question the question might go what is the probability of getting a blue-eyed child now in that instance you can see the probability is one in four or 25 percent okay so answer the question whatever the question is answer it you do all the hard work draw the genetic diagram out in the big space in the exam paper and then don't answer the question okay that's a really common mistake so hopefully that's clear obviously you can skip back and forth and watch that bit again if you need to the slightly richer question for those maths buffs out there goes like this 
what's the probability of two consecutive offspring? So brother and sister or two brothers, two sisters, siblings, whatever, from this, this parental couple, they have a, a child and then another one. What's the probability of having two blue-eyed children? Okay, well, what we do there, we should know about multiplying probabilities, right, is we just take the first probability, one in four, and multiply it by the second probability, one in four. And one in four times one in four, four times four, 16. So it's one in 16. Okay, All right. And obviously you can do that as a, as a decimal if you'd like to as well. All right. So that is a slightly higher level question, probably the hardest level genetics question. You know, that's, we're probably not going any further than that before we start grazing onto to A level. Right. So take a moment at this point, I reckon, to pause and have a think. See if you can work it out for your own family. All right. For some of you, it'll be super, super easy. You've got brown eyes, parents got brown eyes, mum's got brown eyes, dad's got brown eyes, all the grandparents have got brown eyes, brown eyes, brown eyes. So you'll just be a table full of big bees, right? Easy. Some of you, it'll be a bit more difficult. Some of you, you won't be able to do it because you don't know what your parents' eye colours are or, or you've got a bit more of a complex thing. And some of you are going to ask about green and hazel and all this kind of stuff. Well, shades of brown are just brown. Obviously, there are darker and lighter shades of brown those are all controlled by different alleles and they have a different levels of dominance over one another green i would say depending on the shade of green is probably about where blue is so brown would be dominant to green maybe blue is dominant to green as well so you can try and work that out for me it'd be quite straightforward my dad's got blue eyes so he's little b little b my mum's got brown eyes i have blue eyes so she must have a recessive blue gene so my mum's big B, uh, little b, my dad is little b, little b, which means that there's a one in two chance of me having brown eyes or blue eyes. Dad is always going to donate a blue gene because that's what he's got. He's got the recessive phenotype. Mum, either blue or brown. And so 50-50 chance I was going to be blue eyed, which I am, or brown eyed, which I'm not. OK, and actually that's worked out really well um, for this example, because I'm blue eyed and my one and only sibling, my sister, is brown. Okay, so mum gave me a blue eye gene and her a brown eye gene. Okay, so pause the video here, see if you can work that out. That should be quite straightforward. Okay, hopefully you've managed to do that. So let's look at a little bit of history. The guy who managed to find this out, we'll come back to this guy a bit more at another time, is a guy called Gregor Mendel. Okay, and he was an Austrian monk, lived sort of overlapping with it just before Charles Darwin, and we get more into the history of these guys. Uh, as we go through the spec, an incredible time of discovery then. He did his experiments on peas in the mid-1800s. Uh, an Austrian monk probably didn't have an awful lot else to do, apart from breed pea plants. So he was the first person to spot that if you took um, certain characteristics in peas and crossed them together, you either got one or the other. Now, he clearly didn't know anything about DNA or genes. He didn't know what you know about how genes work and producing proteins and all that kind of stuff. But he noticed this idea that if you took a tall pea plant and a dwarf pea plant, a lot of the time if you crossed them you didn't get something that was in between. You either got tall or you got short. And the same with smooth and wrinkly peas, okay, the, the, the texture and the colour of the peas. okay. And he noticed that this was happening in a very, very regular right, pattern, this sort of three to one, tall to short kind of arrangement. Here's a diagram, show a little bit about what he did. Now I've broken the convention a little bit by using S and W, right, for smooth and wrinkly. We shouldn't really do that, but, but as smooth is, a, is an S, a capital S and a small S might not have been great. So he took two parents and he was doing this experiment, uh, taking, them, taking the pollen, smearing it on the flower, the breeding specific peas together, right, and he found that the offspring always came out in this ratio, three to one, three to one, three to one. Now his results he published were a little bit too perfect, leading to speculation that he faked them a bit and, and massaged them a bit. But when his experiments were repeated, shown to be right. Okay, so big S, big S, big S, little W, big S, little W, and little W, little W in that three to one ratio. The phenotypes three tall and one short. Okay, so he was the first person to spot this. Now we still do this kind of cross breeding experiment, breeding different uh, organisms together. Like to try and learn things about genetics. We don't use peas anymore, mainly because it's not really applicable to us. In a medical context, plants are quite different. So what we need is something like an animal that breeds really, really quickly, and nobody really cares if you do unspeakably cruel things to. So Q, 
flies. Okay, so you can do that, you can draw that table, right? But Q flies. Okay, Drosophila melagaster, most the little annoying flies that buzz around your fruit bowl in the summer, right? When your fruit's been decaying in the bowl for too long. These are called fruit flies, Drosophila melagaster, and they're one of the most highly studied organisms on the planet. They breed really easily and they're animals, of course, so they've got a similar genome to us. Not that similar because they're insects, obviously, but you know, it's much easier to do this than it would be with humans or with chimps or whatever it is. Okay, and we've done some weird stuff like create crossbreeds with four sets of wings. So instead of having head, thorax, abdomen, they've got head, thorax, thorax, abdomen. So we've got duplications of the genes that control body organization there. First, another four winger. Extra eyes instead of antenna. So they should have antenna here, but look, that's another eye. We've got one eye, so that face hasn't formed uh, fully there. We've got no mouth parts down there, so that one will have starved to death pretty quickly after hatching. No wings at all, all sorts of freaky stuff. Now here are some other examples of the kind of questions you might be able to get, which if you've cottoned onto this kind of way of thinking really well, then maybe you can already have a go at Okay, So tables as follows. Draw the table for each of the following examples. Work out what the kids will be like, who will carry the gene, um, and who will not know it. So who will carry a gene, who won't know it. So we've got that example is my family example. Maybe you've already drawn one if your family is exactly the same as mine. Now, we're going to come on to what these diseases are more in the next lesson. But let's say mum has sickle cell anemia and dad doesn't. So we've got homozygous recessive and homozygous dominant using S's. And one of the kids has, someone with, has kids with someone of the same gene. So that's a two generation one. So you've got little s, little s, big s, big s. Again, sorry to use the s. Um, Cross those together, you've got what's the answer to number two, cross them with someone else with the same genes, and what you get. That's basically working through what we talked about all the way from beginning to end. And then number four, dad is colorblind, and another one that's a genetic uh, disorder. Uh, little c, little c, mum has colorblindness in the family, big c, little c. Now, colorblindness isn't as straightforward as that, but that's a good example to be working with as well. Apart from, I've picked probably the word, apart from the B's, the worst letters to use uh, for those ones. The big S and little s are not exactly great. Okay? So those are some examples. Pause the video now, have a go at those, see if you can work those out. You should get into the habit of drawing a few genetic diagrams. Okay, so moving on then to our last example for today. So here are the here are the chromosomes for an entire human. Now obviously these are taken during mitosis. We know that because look, the chromosomes have doubled up. Remember the rant from last lesson? That is not a pair of chromosomes. That's one chromosome. That's one chromosome. That's one chromosome. That's one. This is a pair of chromosomes. This is what's called a human carrier type. And it's basically university level cutting and sticking. You smush a cell, take a photo of the uh, take a photo of the chromosomes, and then cut them out and order them up. I actually have fridge magnets uh, of, of these and occasionally just challenge myself to do human carrier typing for a bit of a laugh. Right, from this you should be able to tell something about this person which is very important and is on your syllabus. Pair 23 are what we call the sex chromosomes. They define your biological sex, okay? Your chromosomal sex. You've got big X and little y there. X, Y, you can see how much smaller the Y is than the X. That makes that person a male, as you would know, okay? If this was female, X, X, okay? You've got two X's and no little Y, right? So, in terms of sex determination, hopefully you can now pause the video again and try and work out the answer to this question by doing a table, right? What's mum going to have to have as far as chromosomes go? X's or Y's or a mixture? What's dad going to have to have? And again, remember, we have just looked at that, okay? Work it out by doing the table. Why are half of us male and half of us female when three quarters of the sex chromosomes are X and only one quarter is Y? Okay, pause the video there and have a go. Okay, good. So, what you should have worked out initially, remember what the markings for. First mark is to work out what the parental genotypes are. So mum is XX, dad's XY. This time obviously we're using whole chromosomes rather than individual genes, but it doesn't matter, the mechanics work the same way. Dad has half Y sperm and half X sperm, and mum right, just produces X eggs. Okay, we then do the table. If this sperm meets that egg, uh, then you've got a girl. 
if this sperm meets uh, that if this sperm meets that egg then you've got a boy this uh, sperm meets this egg then you've got a girl this sperm meets this egg then you've got a boy okay as you can see you've got 50 50 uh, 50 50 there boys and girls from doing the genetic um, the genetic cross okay it also shows you which parent defines the gender of the child and it is actually the father that defines the gender if the father donates a, a y chromosome or a y chromosome there then it's going to be a boy if the father donates an x chromosome it's going to be a girl because the mum only has x chromosomes to donate okay so uh, all that henry VIII stuff complete nonsense okay it was obviously henry's fault that he uh, wasn't having sons when he wanted to which obviously a lovely history biology crossover so hopefully that explains uh, a little bit of that interestingly in birds it's the other way around right in birds the females are xy and the males are xx weird quirk of evolution this but this applies to all mammals and that leads on to the fantastic uh, subjects of inheritance of diseases the idea of constructing genetic family trees which are some of the hardest questions that you could be asked about and indeed going back to the top of this lesson where family resemblance comes from all that next time thanks very much